You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Could we really look at our children and say, you could be the next president? The feeling most people get when they hear a Barack Obama speech, my, I felt this thrill going up my leg. I mean, well, I don't have that too often. It felt like the bureaucracy of government had taken all of our hope away, and it feels like it's back. Chase go go. Oh, yes, it will. <laughs> yes, we can. Louder. Yes, we can. Louder. Yes, we can. Speaking with the hubris and complete inversion of reality that has defined his entire political career, Obama ends his time in office exactly as he started it, lying through his teeth. I am very proud of the fact that uh, we will, knock on wood, leave this administration without significant scandal. But this lie about a scandal-free presidency is especially galling because it encapsulates all of the lies of the past eight years. In reality, as even a cursory examination of the record demonstrates, the administration of President Barack Obama has been nothing but eight years of unrelenting lies and scandals. There were the big lies. I taught the Constitution for 10 years. I believe in the Constitution and I will obey the Constitution of the United States. We're not going to use signing statements as a way of doing an end run around Congress. Well, that was candidate Obama then. This is President Obama now. He just issued a signing statement on Friday attaching it to the 2011 budget bill. In fact, he has issued nearly 20 such signing statements since taking office. There were the bigger lies. When there's a bill that ends up on my desk as president, you, the public, will have five days to look online and find out what's in it before I sign it so that you know what your government's doing. Uh, Speaker, in order to try to figure out what we're doing, how much damage the country, I tried to get a copy of the bill. We have out here on the table 2454 that has 1,090 pages in it, but I've understood since debate in here that there's another 300 pages that were added in the middle of the night. My inquiry is, how do I get a copy of the other 300 pages that people on here, on here uh, or here on the floor I hadn't had a chance to read or see. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it away from the fog of the controversy. There were the brazen lies. You can keep your plan if you are satisfied with it. If you like the plan you have, you can keep it. If you like your plan and you like your doctor, you won't have to do a thing. You keep your plan. If you like your health care plan, You'll be able to keep your health care plan. If you've got health insurance, you can keep it. Uh, but for the average person, many of fo uh, folks who don't have health insurance initially, um, you know, they're going to have to make some choices, and they might end up having to switch doctors. The lies from his first months in office. But if you are ready for change, then we can go ahead and tell the lobbyists their days of setting the agenda in Washington are over. They have not funded my campaign, they will not run my White House, and they will not drown out the voices of the American people when I'm President of the United States of America. Just this weekend, the New York Times published a list of names, a rather long list of names, of people who are working on Obama's transition team or who have accepted jobs in his White House, who are either former lobbyists or who have close ties to lobbyists. The lies from his first day in office. Let me say it as simply as I can. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this presidency. This is the most transparent administration in history. Originally scheduled to be bestowed on the president in a publicly scheduled ceremony at the White House during Sunshine Week, that ceremony was canceled at the last moment, and the award, supposedly a token of praise for Obama's stated commitment to government openness, was itself bestowed on the president in a secret, off-the-record meeting to which the press was not invited. One of the other things we discovered on this Sunshine Week, in addition to 
not only are they exempting themselves from FOIA requests, but the Obama administration sets even a new record for denying and censoring government files. And the lies from before he was even in office. President, could you please react to the reports of uh, secret government surveillance of phones and internet? And can you also assure Americans that the government, your government, doesn't have some massive secret database of all their personal online information and activities? Yeah. The, uh, you know, when I came uh, into this office, uh, I made two commitments that are more important than any commitment I make. Number one, to keep the American people safe. And number two, uh, to uphold the Constitution. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our Constitution and our freedom. The programs that have been discussed over the last couple of days in the press uh, are secret in the sense that they're classified. But they're not secret in the sense that uh, when it comes to telephone calls, Every member of Congress has been briefed on this program. That means no more illegal wiretapping of American citizens. What uh, the intelligence community is doing is looking at phone numbers and durations of calls. No more national security letters to spy on citizens who are not suspected of a crime. No more tracking citizens who do nothing more than protest a misguided war. What uh, the intelligence community is doing is looking at phone numbers and durations of calls. No more ignoring the law when it is inconvenient. But by sifting through this so-called metadata, they may identify potential leads with respect to folks who might engage in terrorism. But despite the endless litany of broken promises that Obama has left in his wake, his most striking betrayals of the public's trust weren't lies at all. Instead, the strange mass hysteria that surrounded his ascent to the Oval Office, that hope and change delirium that swept up untold millions, caused others to project their ideas and ideals onto him. Suddenly he was being anointed as a man of peace before making a single, substantive action. God morgen, good morning. Den norske Nobelkomité har bestemt at Nobels fredspris for 2009 skal tildeles president Barack Obama for hans ekstraordinære innsats for å styrke internasjonal diplomati og mellomfolkelig samarbeid. Den novise Nobelkomité has decided that the Nobel Peace Prize for 2009 is to be awarded to President Barack Obama for his extraordinary efforts to strengthen international diplomacy and cooperation between peoples. As farcical as that announcement seemed at the time, how much more galling does it seem now, after Peace Prize Obama has gone down in the history books as the first and only president in U.S. history to be at war every single day of his eight-year administration? Indeed, for people around the world, Obama will be defined by the wars of imperial aggression that he waged across seven different theaters during his time in office. There was the war in Afghanistan, now the longest ever military engagement in the history of the United States. October 7th, 2016 marks the 15th anniversary of the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan by U.S.-led NATO forces. Fifteen years since the bombs began raining down on the country, Fifteen years of drone strikes and civilian massacres, detainees and prison torture, insurgency and bombings, warlords and drug lords and CIA kickbacks. Fifteen years of death. Fifteen years of destruction. And still, like a decades-long nightmare, it continues. I'm announcing an additional adjustment to our posture. Instead of going down to 5,500 troops by the end of this year, the United States will maintain approximately 8,400 troops in Afghanistan into next year through the end of my administration. The narrow missions assigned to our forces will not change. They remain focused on supporting Afghan forces and going after terrorists. 
But maintaining our forces at this specific level, based on our assessment of the security conditions and the strength of Afghan forces, will allow us to continue to provide tailored support to help Afghan forces continue to improve. The war against Libya, undertaken without even congressional approval and waged under false pretenses. Fox News has revealed today that a bipartisan group of lawmakers, headed by Representatives Dennis Kucinich and Walter Jones, will be filing a federal lawsuit against the Obama administration addressing the constitutional and legal justifications for military action in Libya. The announcement comes a day after the release of House Speaker John Boehner's publicized warning to the president in the form of a letter urging Mr. Obama to provide an explanation for the continued engagement in the region and refusal to acknowledge the congressional role in military operations. We are staring not only into the maelstrom of war in Libya, the code of behavior we are establishing sets a precedent for the potential of ever more violent conflicts in Syria, Iran, and the specter of the horrifying chaos of generalized war throughout the Middle East. Our continued occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan makes us more vulnerable, not less vulnerable, to being engulfed in this generalized war. The Libyan opposition and the Arab League appealed to the world to save lives in Libya. And so at my direction, America led an effort with our allies at the United Nations Security Council to pass a historic resolution that authorized a no-fly zone to stop the regime's attacks from the air and further authorized all necessary measures to protect the Libyan people. If this compassion for the plight of men and women in Libya was so heartfelt, why is it that you have heard nothing whatsoever about Libya in the last two years from the same politicians and talking heads who persuaded you that dropping bombs on the country was the only way to save it? Is it because the situation was resolved with the death of Gaddafi and the virtuous Western-backed freedom fighters have established a happy, prosperous, functioning society of peace and happiness? Of course not. Libya is on the way to becoming a terrorist outpost for possible future attacks on Europe. Uh, the prospect has been raised by Libya's former prime minister who came to power following the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime. Uh, he recently fled the country where rival militias run rampant and are in de facto control of the state. Well, the thing is, uh, uh, the, the way RTP was manipulated to legitimize the invasion, bombing and fragmentation of Libya, because this is what's happening nowadays. Look at what Libya is post-NATO intervention. It's a totally failed state run by militias. And nobody cares about what's going on in Libya. Proof number one, it disappeared from the news cycle completely. Proof number two, what only matters to the so-called international community, which, as we know, is comprised of uh, U.S., Britain, France, uh, Tel Aviv, and the Persian Gulf monarchies, and nobody else, maybe Turkey sometimes, no? or Japan or South Korea. This is the international community. Uh, the only thing that mattered for them was uh, uh, the oil, gas, and further on, the water, of course. This is in terms of the three major uh, French water companies. And nobody cares what's going to happen to Libya. Libya is going to be mired in civil war for years and probably decades from now on. But nobody cares. The war in Pakistan waged with drone strikes on civilians. A United Nations team says more than 400 civilians have fallen victim to U.S. military drone strikes against Islamic militants. Members of the team urged U.S. leaders to release data on casualties in the interest of transparency. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights asked the team to compile a report on the U.S. drone program in countries including Pakistan, Afghanistan and Yemen. UN Special Rapporteur Ben Emerson says at least 400 civilians have been killed in Pakistan since 2004. Anger on the streets of Pakistan against the U.S. drone campaign. Human rights activists and representatives from religious parties have demonstrated in Pakistani cities including the capital Islamabad 
to condemn what they see as the violation of their country's sovereignty. Numerous protests have been held in the past since the U.S. began its drone strikes in Pakistan in 2004 under its so-called war on terror. Pakistanis are also angry at the U.S. drone campaign over civilian casualties that they have caused. Demonstrators say that the attacks by the unmanned aircraft must end in Pakistan and that the mere condemnation by the government is not enough. We want our government to take action to stop the violation of our country's sovereignty because it was the government that allowed the U.S. to launch its drone strikes. Authorities should inform us about the steps needed to stop these attacks. The Jonas brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans. But uh, boys don't get any ideas. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. <laughs> you think I'm joking? The war against Syria, a war waged in conjunction with the ongoing war in Iraq and fought via al-Qaeda-linked proxy forces and an Islamic State militia trained by American forces. There is a great irony here in the sense that if you wanted to believe in an expansive definition of the 2001 use of authorization of force, it says go after al-Qaeda and associated forces. Well, al-Qaeda and associated forces are opposing Assad. So if you want to believe in an expansive definition of the 2001 AUMF, you might believe that you could actually support Assad with arms that the original use of authorization of force actually would justify giving arms to Assad. And I'm not proposing that, but I am proposing that you will be giving arms to the side that is fighting against Assad that has elements of al-Qaeda. So if al-Qaeda is our sworn enemy, why is the United States supporting al-Qaeda fighters as part of the Syrian opposition, just as we did al-Qaeda fighters in the Libyan uprising? Well, that was the question I posed to President Obama during my one-on-one -on -one interview with him. Uh, you mentioned about al-Qaeda during your speech, going after al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, certainly going after them in Yemen as well. Yeah. And yet there's some concern about the U.S. funding uh, the Syrian opposition when there are a lot of reports that al-Qaeda is kind of heading up that opposition. Uh, how do you justify the two? Well, I, uh, I share that concern. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is to say we will provide non-lethal assistance to Syrian opposition leadership that are committed to a political transition, committed to... Uh, a, uh, an observance of human rights. Well, in the video, the commander, his, he goes by the name of Abu Sakar, he has uh, found a man, a soldier from the Syrian army, dead uh, by bullet, I've been told. And he took a knife and he cut out a, uh, a hole in the chest and pulled out the lungs and the hearts. And while being videotaped, he held up the lung and said, uh, you dogs of Bashar, this is, this is how we will treat you. I'll eat your hearts and your livers. And uh, he took a bite in the video. And um, it was meant as a message to the regime. Uh, Syria, we backed, I believe, in some cases, some of the wrong people. And uh, not in the right part of the Free Syrian Army. And that's a little confusing to people. So uh, I've always maintained, and go back quite some time, that we were backing the wrong types. I think it's going to turn out maybe this weekend in a new special that Brett Baer is going to have Friday that's going to show some of those weapons from Benghazi ended up in the hands of ISIS. So we helped build ISIS. Now there's a danger there and I'm with you. Several weeks ago, former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency Michael Flynn made waves in the media when he told Al Jazeera the Obama administration turned a blind eye to warnings that the self-proclaimed Islamic State was on the rise. Speaking about a declassified DIA memo which predicted the Islamic State's rise as a result of the West policy of backing Syrian rebels, Flynn told Jazeera's Mehdi Hassan the administration ignored his analysis, saying, I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. WikiLeaks released audio from the September 22nd meeting in which John Kerry admitted to allowing the growth of ISIS. The reason Russia came in is because ISIL was getting stronger. Gas was threatening the possibility of going to Damascus and so forth. And that's why Russia came in, because they didn't want a Daesh government. And they supported Assad. And, and uh, 
And we know that this was, this was growing. We were watching. We saw that, that Dash was growing in strength. And we thought Assad was threatened. Uh, we thought, however, we could probably manage, uh, you know, that Assad might then negotiate. Instead of negotiating, you got Assad. Now you got the Putin to support him. The war in Somalia a military action justified by the president in a move that is as utterly ridiculous as it is insulting to the intelligence as self-defense. September the 11th, 2001, the world changed when members of al-Qaeda hijacked passenger planes, slamming them into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania. Now, a few days later, the U.S. Congress passed a sweeping new law called the Authorization for Use of Military Force, the AUMF. It provides the president with broad authority to, quote, use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September the 11th, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States. Now, it's important for you to hear the actual language of that law, because it shows just how you can justify certain U.S. military and intelligence activities around the world if there's a connection somehow with al-Qaeda. Now to Somalia. We know the U.S. has recently increased its on-the-ground military activity against al-Shabaab forces in support of Somali and African Union forces. But up until now, those activities have mostly been justified as being in self-defense. Some analysts have pointed out that it's now a pretty thin legal justification, given that the U.S. appears to be actively involved in battlefield situations. So now, the New York Times, citing unnamed U.S. officials, says that as part of the president's regular, regular letter to Congress, listing updates to current U.S. military operations abroad, he will include al-Shabaab as part of the groups defined under the AUMF law. If that happens, it will provide U.S. forces soon to be under a Trump administration more power to actively pursue al-Shabaab using, quote, all necessary and appropriate force. And the war in Yemen, yet another military involvement that the average American doesn't even know about, let alone understand the reasoning for, and that has inevitably embroiled the American military in yet more war crimes. At least 13 people were killed in a U.S. drone strike in Yemen. There was a convoy of vehicles traveling in Rada, which is the capital of Baida province. Uh, and where were they going? A wedding. It was a group of vehicles that was driving to a wedding. The U.S. thought that it was Al-Qaeda, but it was a party. The strike, quote, left charred bodies and burnt out cars on the road. Documents obtained by Reuters show the U.S. government's concerned it could be implicated in potential war crimes in Yemen because of its support for a Saudi-led coalition air campaign. The Obama administration's continued to authorize weapons sales to Saudi Arabia, despite warnings last year from government lawyers that it might be considered a co-belligerent under international law. This comes as a, Reut as a Saudi airstrike on a funeral home in the capital, Sana'a, on Saturday, killed at least 140 mourners and wounded more than 500 others. Survivors spoke of back-to-back -back bombings during a funeral service for the father of an official with the rebel Houthi government, which controls Sana'a. This is a heinous crime one can barely imagine. No one ever thought they would strike a mourning hall. Can anyone imagine hitting people mourning to death? The battle is taking place on the borders and several other places, yet they bomb a hall. And now they deny it was their missiles. We are all here. Our homes are nearby. We heard the missiles and the planes. There were two planes and four airstrikes, not just two. Thousands of Yemenis gathered at the United Nations building in Sana'a on Sunday, calling for an international investigation into the assault. The attack was carried out with warplanes and munitions sold to the Saudi-led coalition by the United States. The U.S. Air Force continues to provide mid-air refueling to Saudi warplanes. At home, meanwhile, 
Obama will be known for aggressively expanding the militarized police state that Bush brought in after the false flag events of September 11th, 2001. Well, that's not who we're supposed to be, but that's exactly who Barack Obama is. That's who he is. It would change. He was, look, look, people sometimes say, oh, no, 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 you, he never promised not to spy in on you. Yes, he did. He promised it right there in the OA campaign. So, like, this is supposed to be a big faux pas and like, oh, no, don't do it. He lied. It's not subtle. He said there will be no spying on citizens who are not suspected of a crime. He lied. There, there is spying on all of us, and we are not suspected of a crime. Barack Obama is a liar. Can I make it clear? Like, that's like a big thing to say, oh, my God, wow, he just called a politician a liar. Yes, Obama is a politician, he's big brother, and he's a liar. Wow, Obama seems like he's really against this wiretapping thing, huh? Man, when he gets into office, he's going to fix it. Yeah, it's going to be a bright new day for America once we get Bush out and put Obama in. He f***ing sounds like he's just as pissed off about this illegal wiretapping as we are. Well, guess what? We voted him in twice, and he didn't do jack about the illegal wiretapping. Oh, I'm sorry, he did do something about it. He expanded it! Each year, the United States Department of Defense's budget and expenditures are approved by Congress, which must pass a National Defense Authorization Act in order to fund the DoD. The most recent bill, however, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012, shocked many by containing an extraordinary provision allowing for the indefinite detention without trial of anyone even suspected of providing support to individuals or groups identified as terrorists. Although this represents little change from the U.S. government's modus operandi in waging the so-called global war on terror, many were amazed to discover that this provision specifically applies to American citizens who can now be detained by American military personnel anywhere in the world, including on U.S. soil, and held indefinitely without trial. Perhaps it is not surprising that President Obama chose New Year's Eve as the date to sign the NDAA, as the revelry of the holiday predictably distracted Americans from the event. Particularly remarkable is the fact that this legislation has been almost universally identified as an overt act of tyranny by commentators of all political stripes, perhaps most importantly from sources that have traditionally defended the actions of Obama and his administration. The ACLU said that Mr. Obama's decision to sign the National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA, including the controversial detainee provisions, would tarnish his presidency. Quote, President Obama's action is a blight on his legacy because he will forever be known as the president who signed indefinite detention without charge or trial into law. I will choose in my administration not to indefinitely detain U.S. citizens meaning another administration can choose to do so, meaning that the bill says, yes, the president has the authority and the option of detaining U.S. citizens without a trial indefinitely. This is definitive. And it's not just my interpretation. It's not just Glenn Greenwald's interpretation. As we told you yesterday, the team of lawyers at the ACLU, whose job it is to protect our civil liberties, says that is definitely the correct interpretation, and it is hideous. Now today, more people piling on. My understanding is that when Carl Levin thought, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, thought in the Senate that the provision for it being applicable to American citizens on American soil was stripped out, the White House had it put back in, which is just <laughs> dumber than mud. I can't understand how we'd want to go back to Reconstruction days. I mean, that's the last time we destroyed Posse Comitatus. But this is the White House that thinks that it's okay uh, to assassinate U.S. citizens abroad without new due process in the case that, of Anwar al So that's why true. wouldn't they want that in? Because this is true. codifying powers that they've already determined they have. It's very true. On Tuesday, the New York Times published a major expose about how President Obama personally oversees a, quote, secret kill list containing the names and photos of individuals targeted for assassination in the U.S. drone war. According to the Times, Obama signs off on every targeted killing in Yemen and Somalia and the more complex or risky strikes in Pakistan. Individuals on the list include U.S. citizens as well as teenage girls as young as 17 years old. Glenn, can you comment on that? 
Well, we, of course, known for a long time that the president of the United States believes that he has the power to order people killed, assassinated in total secrecy, without any due process, without transparency or oversight of any kind. I really do believe it's literally the most radical power that a government and a president can seize. And yet the Obama administration has seized this power and exercised it aggressively with very little controversy. Surveying the flaming wreckage of the last eight years, Obama's duped supporters will now be the first to tell you that you can't blame everything that happens on the president. The same people who voted Obama into office in the earnest belief that he would change the system now solemnly intone that he was just one man up against an entire system. But if a leader is defined by those they appoint, Obama failed with flying colors there too. Just look at the warmongers and criminals that he and his financial and corporate string pullers stuffed into his administration. When I first started assembling this administration, I knew we were about to face some of the most difficult years this country has seen in generations. Uh, the challenges were big, and the margin for error was small. Two wars, uh, an economy on the brinks of collapse, and a set of tough choices uh, about issues that we had put off for decades, the choices about health care and energy and education, uh, how to rebuild a middle class that had been struggling for far too long. And I knew that I needed somebody at my side who I could count on day and night uh, to help get the job done. In my mind, there was no candidate for the job of chief of staff who would meet the bill as well as Rahm Emanuel. In this case, the mainstream press hasn't failed. They've mentioned the fact that Rahm Emanuel is a principal node in the Israel lobby uh, campaign contribution network, that he wasn't necessarily really behind Obama until he switched sides in June uh, away from Hillary Clinton, probably because it looked like she wasn't going to be viable, and then introduced uh, Obama to the power elite of APAC at their annual conference. And ever since then, uh, and this is why I say it's a remarkable mirror of the Kennedy administration, of course, he's been named chief of staff. Uh, we know all about his father's illustrious past. As a, the press calls it gun running. I would call it, <laughs> I would call it something different with the Ergun and his own participation in Israel's war efforts uh, back in the 91 Gulf War, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what people don't understand is the following. Obama's made some pretty implicit promises about winding down the confrontational approach to the Middle East, as well as getting troops out of Iran. But yet he's appointed Rahm Emanuel as his chief of staff. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. Today, though, I'm looking ahead to my second term. And I am very proud to announce my choice for America's next Secretary of State, John Kerry. In a sense, John's entire life has prepared him for this role. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> so amidst all these reports of, of bony, bogus stuff going on, how could you concede the election on the day? How could you concede the 2004 election on the day? When, in this book, it said there were 5 million votes that were suppressed and you won the election. Didn't you want to be president? I'm, sorry, I'm not even done yet. I have two more questions. If you were so against Iran, how come you were not saying, let's impeach Bush now? Impeach Bush now before we can invade Iran. Why don't we impeach him? Impeach Bush. Clinton, Clinton was impeached for what? A blowjob? Why don't we impeach Bush? All right? Also, are you a member of, you a member of Skull and Bones and Collins and Bush? Are you in the same <laughs> secret society? So, Joe, for your faith in your fellow Americans, for your love of country, and for your lifetime of service that will endure through the generations, uh, I'd like to ask the military aide to join us on stage.
for the final time as president, I am pleased to award our nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And I, I don't remember what I said to my on-air partner, Pat. We were talking about it, and I said, you know what? How fast did the Patriot Act? How did they write that? How many pages was that? I never even thought, you know, this is in the innocent days. Who wrote the Patriot Act? Because we know who wrote the Stimulus uh, uh, Act, and that was the Apollo Alliance. We looked it up. Does anybody here in the audience know who wrote the Patriot Act or when it was written? This will blow your mind. It was written in 1995. 1995, including the wiretapping and everything else. America, you know who wrote it? One of the biggest union guys of them all, Joe Biden. But in a nutshell, Joe Biden uh, in 1995 wrote this uh, legislation, which basically is, in a nutshell, the Patriot Act. They reworded it. They rearranged some of the paragraphs, but it's pretty much almost verbatim uh, the language that is in the Patriot Act. And so it existed some seven years before 9-11. Here's the thing, Hillary Clinton, she's been a first lady. She's been a senator. She's been my secretary of state. She's been in the room when tough decisions were made. She knows how those decisions can affect a veteran or a soldier or a kid who needs a great education or a worker who's fighting for a good job or a raise or a decent retirement. And I will tell you, even in the middle of crisis, she is calm and cool and collected. So, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed. Yes, yes. we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> this record of crime, deceit, and aggression is enough to make all but the most psychopathic recoil in disgust. But none of Obama's shameful actions as commander-in-chief should be remotely surprising to those who were willing to look beyond the hype and look squarely at the facts. His supporters on the left imagined him to be an answer to the outrageous criminality of the banksters on Wall Street, even as those very same banksters were his top campaign contributors. He even took time out of his 2008 campaign to show his complete support for the disastrous banker bailout that was sneaking its way through Congress. As Republican John McCain and his Democratic rival Barack Obama head to Washington to help broker a deal on a Wall Street rescue plan, McCain, speaking in New York at the Clinton Global Initiative, said a deal must be achieved by the time financial markets open on Monday. The debate that matters most right now is taking place in the United States Capitol. And I intend to join it. Senator Obama is doing the same. America should be proud of the bipartisanship with that we're seeing. Speaking to the same group by satellite from Florida, Barack Obama agreed with McCain that the $700 billion bailout for the troubled financial industry needs some modifications. But alluding to the White House meeting taking place later in the afternoon, Obama said now is not the time for partisanship. This goes beyond uh, traditional election time politics. Now is the time to come together, Democrats and Republicans, in a spirit of cooperation on behalf of the American people. On this vote, the yeas are 263, the nays are 171. The motion is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. But while there's plenty of blame to go around, and many in Washington and Wall Street who deserve it, all of us... All of us have a responsibility to solve this crisis because it affects the financial well-being of every single American. There will be time to punish those who set this fire, but now's not the time to argue about how it got set or did the neighbor sleep in his bed or leave the stove on. Right now we want to put out that fire. And now's the time for us to come together and do that. And then his supporters acted surprised when his administration failed to prosecute anyone at all for the largest swindle in the history of the planet. So far in civil proceedings, the government has levied several billion dollars in penalties for misconduct in a crisis that's cost investors and homeowners many hundreds of billions of dollars. But to date, 
Not one senior Wall Street executive has been held criminally liable by the Department of Justice for activities related to the financial crisis. So Eric Holder uh, went in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday and they asked him about that. The same Eric Holder who earlier was saying, yeah, I could drop a drone on you if you're a regular citizen. I don't need a trial, stinking trials, I don't need them, right? I can just execute you. But when it comes to the bankers, this is what he said instead. I am concerned that the size of some of these institutions becomes so large that it does become difficult for us to, um, to prosecute them when we are hit with um, indications that if you do prosecute, if you do bring a criminal charge, uh, it will have a negative impact on the national economy, perhaps even the world economy. And I think that is a function of the fact that some of these institutions have become too large. Amazing. In actual Senate testimony, he says, well, yeah, okay, they're too large, but what can we do? So it'll hurt the global economy, so we're not going to do our job. Get out of jail, free card. Here you go. Use it anytime you like. Not only did we not prosecute you for past crimes, we're telling you right here in public, we're not going to prosecute you for future crimes. Have at it, hoss. But just in case there was any doubt as to who put Obama in power and whose interests he was working for, the Podesta email leak confirmed that not just Attorney General Holder, but almost the entirety of Obama's cabinet was hand-selected for him by Citigroup. So this particular WikiLeaks email is from a month before Obama first became president. And it's between John Podesta, who was then head of Obama's transition team for president, and Michael Froman, who was at the time an executive at Citigroup, Citibank's parent company. Froman emailed Podesta a list of people who would be good choices for Obama's cabinet. Keep in mind, this is a month before he won the election. As writer David Dayan put it, the cabinet list ended up being almost entirely on the money. It correctly identified Eric Holder for the Justice Department, Janet Napolitano for Homeland Security, Robert Gates for Defense, Rahm Emanuel for Chief of Staff, Peter Orzog for the Office of Management and Budget, Arne Duncan for... All right, let's skip ahead. No one gives a shit about Arne Duncan. <laughs> Arne Duncan doesn't care about Arne Duncan. <laughs> for the Treasury, three possibilities were on the list. Robert Rubin, Larry Summers, and Timothy Geithner. Tim Geithner ended up being Treasury Secretary, and the other two played prominent roles. So think about that. An executive at Citibank's parent company, one of the most powerful banks in the world, gave Obama nearly his entire cabinet, including his economic team, immediately following the 2008 collapse caused by the greed of the big banks. Obama then went on to let Wall Street entirely off the hook for destroying the lives of millions of Americans. Or to put that in a more polite way, Geithner and friends dictated the Obama administration's light touch policy on bank misconduct, which resulted in no serious legal or fiduciary consequences for the major players. Do you see what this leaked email says? The big banks literally decide who runs our economy and our country at least a month before the election even happens. Why should it come as any surprise at all, then, to learn that Obama's signal accomplishment during his time in office, Obamacare, was written by the insurance companies themselves? And I want to single out one person. And that one person is sitting next to me. Her name is Liz Fowler. Liz Fowler is ch our, my chief health counsel. Liz Fowler has put my team together, the health, health care team. Liz Fowler worked for me many years ago, since left the private sector, and then came back when she realized that, that she could be there in the creation of health care reform, because she wanted to, in a certain sense, that to be her, her professional lifetime goal. She put together that, uh, the white paper last November 2008, 87-page um, document, which became the basis, the foundation, the blueprint from which almost all health care measures and all bills, both sides of the aisle I came from. She's an amazing person, she's a lawyer, she's a PhD, she's just so decent, she's always smiling, she's always working, so she's always available to help any center, any staff, and I just, I thank Liz, the bottom of my heart, 
And in many ways, she typifies, she represents um, all of the people who've worked so hard to make this bill such a, an accomplishment. So what you're thinking? So who is this Liz Fowler anyway, and why is it so important to be bringing up this, well, gr gushing and rather embarrassing praise from Senator Baucus on the House floor? Well, it's because Liz Fowler is not just someone who was formerly in private industry, as he tangentially ma made mention of in that speech, but someone who, well, had a very interesting uh, history, and one that we can even pick up from mainstream sources like NBCNews.com, which had a post back a few years ago, Fact or Fiction? Senate Chairman Has Ties to Big Insurer. Quote, Elizabeth Fowler, now, served, now serving as counsel to Baucus on the Finance Committee, worked as an executive, not a lobbyist, for WellPoint, the largest publicly traded commercial health benefits company from 2006 to 2008. Prior to that, she'd worked for Baucus. Committee spokesman, spokeswoman Erin Shields called Fowler one of the brightest healthcare minds in the Senate, and she and the Finance Committee staff have been working day and night to reach the goal of reform that lowers costs and ensures quality affordable healthcare coverage, which is Baucus's priority. Shields added that the only factor that influences his decisions and the decisions of his staff is whether a policy is right for his state and for the American people. According to Senate records, Michelle Easton, former chief health counsel to the Finance Committee under Baucus, is lobbying for WellPoint for her firm, Tarplin Downs & Young. End quote. Well, of course, that, that um, MSM uh, post obviously downplays the important aspects of this. The fact that Liz Fowler, the person who Baucus was gushing about and who was absolutely essential in bringing the Affordable Care Act to the American public was not just a lobbyist for the world, uh, for America and the world's largest publicly traded health benefits company, but was in fact an executive for them. And if we wanted to be even more specific, which oddly NBCNews.com decided not to be, she was a former vice president of WellPoint. So here we have someone in the very heart of the private insurance world coming in to write the very Affordable Care Act, which is supposed to provide all of this wonderful manna from heaven free health care to the public except for the fact that it's going to cost the average American much, much, much more to get insured under this new regime. And John Kerry said, no, 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 we're going to tax your health insurance. We're going to tax those evil insurance companies. We're going to impose a tax that if they sell health insurance, it's too expensive. We're going to tax them. And conveniently, the tax rate will happen to be the marginal tax rate under the income tax code. So basically, it's the same thing. We just tax the insurance companies. They pass it on higher prices. That offsets the tax break we get. It ends up being the same thing. It's a very clever, you know, basically exploitation of the, of, the, of the lack of economic understanding of the American voter. And why should it be a surprise that the military-industrial complex has benefited from yet another Obama accomplishment? A report released recently by the Center for International Policy found that the Obama administration has shattered existing records when it comes to international weapon sales. The report outlines how in President Obama's first five years in office, new agreements under the Pentagon's foreign military sales program, the largest channel for U.S. arms exported, totaled over $169 billion. So even after adjusting that for inflation, that number pales in comparison to the only $30 billion in deals cut by the Bush administration in its entire two terms in office, meaning that the Obama administration officially bears the honor of having approved more weapon sales than any other since World War II. As U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice said the proposed military aid package to Israel is larger than any the United States has ever offered to any country. Under the headline, America's $40 billion aid package to Israel is largest ever. The 10-year aid program would give Israel up to $40 billion to upgrade its military aircraft and missile defense systems to defend against rocks, I mean militants in Lebanon and the Gaza Strip and Al-Qaeda and Islamic State affiliates in Syria and Egypt. The Saudis, an arms deal with them worth $1.29 billion has been approved. The United States has approved a $1.2 billion deal to replenish the Saudi Air Force's arsenal depleted by its controversial bombing campaign against rebels in Yemen. Congress has 30 days to block the sale but is unlikely to do so and shipment of more than 19,000 smart bombs is urgent with strikes continuing daily. 
The simple fact is that the real power in the American oligarchy isn't wielded by the president. Obama was just a smiling, affable teleprompter reader for the powers behind the throne, the deep state. And thanks to NSA whistleblower Russell Tice, we now know that Obama himself was wiretapped and presumably blackmailed, not by the Russian government, but by the NSA itself. And by the way, with respect to my concerns about uh, privacy issues, I will leave this office at some point, sometime in the last next three and a half years. And uh, after that, I will be a private citizen. And I suspect that, uh, you know, on, on a list of people who might be targeted, uh, you know, so that uh, somebody could read their emails or, or listen to their phone calls, I'd probably be pretty high on that list. So it's not as if I don't have a personal interest in making sure my privacy is protected. Last week, NSA whistleblower Russell Tice conducted interviews on Boiling Frog's Post and The Corbett Report, where he revealed shocking new details of the NSA spying scandal. In addition to detailing how the NSA is collecting and storing the content of all electronic communications passing through the United States, he also revealed for the first time some of the specific targets of past NSA wiretapping operations, including senior congressional leaders, the former White House press secretary, high-ranking military generals, the entire Supreme Court, and even then-senator from Illinois and future president, Barack Obama. Yeah, it was, it was uh, journalists. It, were, it was um, members of Congress, uh, both houses, Senate and, uh, and the House, um, especially on the intelligence committees, in the armed services committees, and on judiciary committees, um, and, and as well as the senior leadership in both the House and the Senate. It was judges, um, federal judges, and um, every member of the Supreme Court, all nine, of which I held the, the initial um, uh, targeting of Judge Alito in my hand when, they, when Judge Alito was being put up for um, you know, his position on the Supreme Court. So I saw, I saw the Alito paperwork in my hand uh, physically. Um, it, was, um, it was members of, uh, of a, a few members of, of Bush's own staff um, in, in the White House. Now, who else did they? They went after uh, lots of lawyers and law firms, I noticed. In your um, interview on Boiling Frog's Post, you, you mentioned specifically uh, General Petraeus? Yes, they, they went after senior uh, military leaders. Um, with my satellite stuff, I saw, I saw how they went after, they went after um, the State Department. They went after Colin Powell, Secretary of State. They went after General Sasaki. Uh, and then on the terrestrial side, I saw the paperwork as they were going after um, General Petraeus. Was Barack Obama targeted by this? Uh, yes, he was. As a matter of fact, that was in 2004, probably now, well, late summer time frame. Um, and he was, he was a candidate for senator. He'd already won his primary in Illinois. And that's when I saw um, you know, Barack Obama's name. In the end, Obama's personal failings and foibles are secondary to his main attribute, his willingness to enact the agenda of those who pulled his strings. It is ever so. But the real question is, what have people learned from the disaster of the Obama years? Do they understand the true nature of deep state power? The true continuity of agenda that takes place even as the pendulum swings from left to right? Or are they simply going to fall for the same trick again and again until the final nail is placed in the coffin of human freedom? Well, I've come out of the Bush era where uh, he assigned the law of the U.S. Patriot Act, Bush, which allowed the government to listen on your phone calls, download your emails, come in your home while you're not there and snoop in your home and leave and all kinds of egregious things, which I oppose vocally. So when Obama came around and I thought, wow, this can be a new era. I mean, and he actually talked about limiting government power and stopping war and all those things. So I said, hey, maybe this is the chance we need. He got the Nobel Peace Prize, but he was the first president actually to conduct eight years of war, believe it or not. Last year alone, he dropped 26,000 bombs in the Middle East. Now, this is a guy that early on, some of the, and again, it depends on 
uh, the early analysts from the left wings uh, who dealt with uh, what they call the military industrial complex were saying, hey, he's working with the military industrial complex. We're really surprised. So what I would say is a lot of times with candidates, you have to wait and see what they do before you heap all this praise on them because it builds an expectation and then people buy into a myth. I mean, people are still talking about greatest president ever, but when I look at his record, uh, under the most recent act that he's uh, national defense authorization act that he re-upped he had an anti-propagation a propaganda center now they're going to be watching what we say what we do if we're so-called uh going against the interest of america well anybody out there is a peace activist that's against war and stuff like that is going to be watched even closer now uh and he just his, his justice department just a few days ago uh under obama signed a provision allowing the NSA now to share all our information with 16 federal agencies. That's amazing. Remember, it was Edward Snowden. It wasn't Bush that he was opposing, NSA, Bush's NSA. It was Obama's NSA. So if you add up, at the end of the day, all the things that we see happening, the militarized police grew exponentially under Obama. All this military equipment flowing to local police in this country, tanks, so this all happened under Obama. It all built up under Obama. But I'll say this. Bush started the ball rolling. Obama pushed it faster and bigger. And now we got Donald Trump. I mean, he hasn't stepped into the presidency yet. But do I think he's going to pull back on this power that he has now? Sending Obama sending troops into Poland <laughs> as the final act of his presidency without congressional approval. That violates the Constitution. So... Uh, what we're facing is, I, in my opinion, and I've said it over and over, we're, we're facing a government that's out of control. And uh, it started under Obama. If we really believe in freedom, it's time to step up and act now, America, I'm telling you. So the color card was played very insidiously and effectively by Barack Obama and his handlers, whether it was Lockheed Corporation Goldman Sachs. I mean, it's an endless list that won't be missed, all right? But we have to understand that they have, when I say they, I'm talking about the, the national and global, what I call power elite, that 1% or 1.5%, whatever, all right? They, they, they keep us corralled, if you will, James, on, on a plantation, a plantation, Democrat, Republican plantation, as if that's left and right. It's not. What it is simply is evil. It's a plantation of bloodsuckers, uh, and I don't care what they call themselves. They're now people talking about, oh, we should have Elizabeth Warren. No, we should not have Elizabeth Warren. No, we should not. We don't need Democrats or Republicans. We need each other, each other. And how long will it take the people... In, in, in this country, in the United States, to understand that what it's about is divide and conquer, play each other off against each other, use each other, manipulate through fear, through disinformation. I repeat, disinformation. And that way, control us. Eight years on from that day of infamy, we are left to sort through the ashes of the Obama administration. They are the ashes of the lives destroyed the families torn apart, the countries ruined by yet another willing servant of the American Imperial Project. But if there is any ray of hope, it is that we have here an opportunity to learn a lesson once and for all. Until people stop falling for the lie and refuse to participate in the deep state-approved spectacle of the elections, voting for smiling figureheads on the back of trite toothpaste advertisement slogans like Hope and Change or Make America Great Again, the people of the United States and the people of the world will get exactly what they ask for. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the Corbett Report subscriber. 
a weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com slash support. And with that, I just have two more words to say. Obama out. <laughs>